I have uh, my so, hair mod in case you, know you forgot. Uh, I've been missing in action for a few weeks. Uh, we yeah. had a lot of work out in the Hustang. Um, it's nice to be back and see everyone. Here. And I want to thank everyone uh, who, who kept this there thing going. Go. We did, I understand had a bunch of good meetings the last few months, which I missed. Yeah. And sorry to do so. Um, as usual, I want to just go over our schedule. Uh, let me start with this. We're in the member middle of our next membership drive. It's the end of the year, a little late. Uh, we sent notices out to a lot of folks. This is a good night to sign up for our very nominal membership fees if, if you're ready to. Uh, if you just, this is a group that has members but doesn't have any restrictions. We have meetings 11 months a year, uh, discussions, and it's open to anyone. Uh, you can keep coming without joining. We'd like you to join, but uh, all the literature for that is in the back. We do really two things. We, we have these uh, historical evenings, and we do walking tours. And that's about all the energy we have. And, <laughs> and besides, we, as you'll hear tonight, there's a very good citywide organization that, that handles advocacy very well. And uh, many of you have, have had affiliations now or before with History and Landmarks anyway, and we're, we're glad to be supportive. Um, let me just tell you our next few speakers and about walking tours, and then introduce our speaker for tonight. Quentin Scraybeck, professor, he's from Pittsburgh, worked in the steel mills for a while, now is a professor at Findlay, which is a university in western Ohio. Uh, he's written a series of books called The Boys of Braddock, etc. He's been here before. Those of you who missed him, he's a great speaker and a wonderful Pittsburgher despite being in Ohio. And this time we're going to have him back and focus exclusively on George Westinghouse. And that's coming up in March. And he, he, don't miss it. I will be missing one more month this year for a personal trip and then be back in April. But not just Grayback is great. I'll, in April, Jim Reich, who actually helped uh, with uh, uh, our walking tour, helped plan our, our business walking tour, more of that in a moment. Uh, Jim was head of the Businessmen Association for many years. He's coming in April to talk about ret his retailing in Pittsburgh and the changes and his views of the changes downtown. Partially history, partially current events. In May, Elizabeth Rourke, who's our patron saint, because she got most of the pictures for our Squirrel Hill history book, and who has also spoken to us three or four times, uh, and is a great speaker, is going to come back. Some of you may have seen the print exhibit of Pittsburgh history at the Frick Art Center uh, six, eight months ago. That came from a collection which, once again, uh, Beth Rourke has something to do with. And she's going to come and show us prints and photographs of Pittsburgh in, in um, May. In June, Betty Conley, Betty, where are you? Wave your hand. Hey, Betty, the, the editor of our, the prime editor of our book some years ago. Betty is going to put together and needs people to come and talk to her about a discussion on schools in Squirrel Hill. Betty will have some prepared remarks, but this, this is a program that will only work if everyone uh, puts it on the table. First by giving, talking to Betty about things that she can get ready, and then this is going to be, and we haven't tried this for a while, a discussion about uh, people's remembrances uh, in the schools. And you, you know, we do video of it. Louise, I hope that's okay tonight. If we, sure. Uh, we do video of our programs, and this is going to. And we are building slowly but surely an archives, and this is going to be another step. Betty, did I miss anything? No, that's fine. If anyone would really like to help a whole lot, um, just give me a call or email me. It's bcgoodwork at aol.com. Easy to remember. Or email. Squirrel Hill Historic, if you don't remember that, and we'll get it to Betty. Thank um, you. Our July talk, the last one before the summer, we're working on some stuff, but not ready yet. We're going to do two walking tours again this year. We haven't decided the date in May. We're going to do another business center tour. Aaron Cook is going to do that. 
Uh, only a small group went last year because it was about 120 degrees that day. And uh, we're going we're gonna to do it again. Uh, we'll give announcement to you. On June 6th, Saturday morning, you can write this down now, from 10 to 12, uh, the folks at Chatham and we are going to do a new thing. We're going to do a walking tour of Chatham University campus as a joint venture between us and the university. And the university will be the guide for it. We just would be there, but uh, we'll we'll start having sign-up sheets for that in in the uh, website very shortly. Any questions on the schedule to come? Okay, Pittsburgh history and landmarks. Everyone in this room knows at least a little about, but we're going to get to know more tonight. Um, I can tell you, as someone who's in the historic field, that it is by far one of the best recognized and respected of all the historic groups in the country. And three years ago, History and Landmarks held what's called the National Preservation Conference here that is done by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And it's done every year and it's one of the best conferences in the country because they do lots of tours besides having lecture, uh, you know, meetings and stuff. And uh, folk, I was at Tulsa this year for that meeting they still talk about the conference in Pittsburgh because it, it was such a good one. And History and Landmarks put that together. What I, Louise Sturgis, who's the executive director of History and Landmarks and been there since 81 and a native of Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. has agreed to come. And we've had representatives from History and Landmarks before, but I've asked Louise to start with something that we haven't looked at in great detail here which is how historic preservation really got started in the city. She'll take this in different directions, but that's where she'll start. So we're very happy to have Louise here. Thank you, Michael. And it's great to be here this evening. Um, docents, friends in the audience. Uh, many of you do know the work of Pittsburgh History and Landmarks. And how about from our audience? Anybody have a favorite story to share about preservation in Pittsburgh? An experience, a story that's got to be part of the history? Anyone from the audience want to lead off? <laughs> All right, you're waiting for me then. <laughs> well, let me say that when Michael and I first started talking about my remarks tonight, he had hoped that Arthur could be here, and he was really wanting to know about the history of historic preservation in Pittsburgh. And I began to feel a bit weighted down by that topic and wasn't quite sure how I was going to pull that off. But just yesterday in the office, a staff member had clipped the newspaper article that announced this lecture and stuck it on the little ledge by our secretary's office. And there was the title, The Story of Preservation in Pittsburgh. And I thought, wow, I'm off the hook. Because the history of historic preservation in Pittsburgh, you've got to know all the facts, you've got to have it in sequence just right. But the story opened up the whole kind of world of opportunity to me where I could be a bit more creative in presenting information as I chose about the story of preservation in Pittsburgh. And Al Tandler, an employee at History and Landmarks, head of the Historical Collections Department, came into my office and said, the story of preservation in Pittsburgh is simple. It is the story of the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation. <laughs> I will embellish that with just a bit, but basically you are going to hear from some early sources the story of the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation and why that is the story of preservation in Pittsburgh. One thing I want to share with you, David McCullough. I love his words. He did speak at the National Preservation Conference in 2006. And his words reassure me in the tack that I'm taking tonight. He said, when talking about history, you might have all the facts right but miss the truth. Or, as an alternative, you could have some of the facts right and hit the truth. And so in that spirit today, I'm going to try to hit the truth of historic preservation. And I might not have all the facts right. But that will be the, the um, kind of tone of the, of the evening tonight. David McCullough said, it's not enough to know all the notes. You must hear the music. We'll rely on some of our early books to help you hear that music as Arthur and Jamie speak to us about some of the early experiences. Now, the story of preservation in Pittsburgh as I know it really begins with two women 
not two men. And who would those two women, women be? What are the major, some major preservation accomplishments or successes in Pittsburgh? Yes. Shenley and Frick. Yes, you got it. Shenley and Frick, come up to the podium for the rest of the lecture. She can be your next speaker. But Mary Crow and Shenley, of course, as you all know, inherited the Block House, 1764, oldest datable building west of the Alleghenies, built as a redoubt to Fort Pitt. She inherited that block house from her grandfather, James O'Hara. Well, the Pennsylvania Railroad was expanding down in the Point area at the time. Warehouses, terminal buildings, lots of activity going on. And Henry Clay Frick actually was part of that Pennsylvania operation at the time, the Pennsylvania Railroad. And he really wanted more land and wanted to get rid of that block house. But fortunately, as an expatriate living in London, Mary Crone Shenley said, I will donate that building to the Daughters of the American Revolution. So in 1894, <coughs> she donated the block house to the DAR, and in 1895, that block house opened as a public museum, several months before the Carnegie Museum opened. So the block house today, still run by the DAR, and separate from the Fort Pitt Museum, which is 20 feet away and run by the state, the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, was one of our very early efforts of preservation. And we have Mary Crone Shenley to thank for that, and the DAR that has continued to operate that little blockhouse, the five-sided structure of brick and timber with the gun slit holes in it. Um, we have her to thank for that. And interestingly enough, earlier on, the early, perhaps 1900s, late 1890s, um, an Englishman came to Pittsburgh, and in looking at everything, he said, the blockhouse needs to be preserved. And so that call to action came much earlier, but, or, or um, I guess, 18, he must have come in the, in the mid-1800s. And then Mary Crone Shenley decided in 1894 to go ahead and save that. Okay, Helen Clay Frick. I heard the story always that when she was going to really debut, that her father said, what jewel, what gift can I give to you? And to show and express our love for you. And she said, I don't need a gift, Dad, but I do want you to donate land so children in the city of Pittsburgh have a park. <laughs> and so that was the concept in the beginning of Frick Park. And in 1919, the land was given to the city for a park, and in 1927, Frick Park opened. And that is a wonderful land preservation effort uh, from Helen Clay Frick, who also, of course, lived in and continued to maintain Clayton. And when she died, after years of then getting the house in order as a house museum in 1990, Clayton opened and is now part of the Frick Art and Historical Center. So those two women, Mary Crone Shenley and Hel Helen Clay Frick, really were, I think, instrumental in starting a preservation ethic in the city. And interestingly enough, Helen Clay Frick was an early supporter and friend of Jamie Van Trump, and was one of the first to give a grant, a small grant, to the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation. So, the story, though, really, of preservation in Pittsburgh does go back to Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation. And I can tell some of that story because I've actually been with the organization for 28 of its 45 years. And when we're going to, in a minute, turn to Jamie and Arthur, I will mention what Michael did, that since 1964 and our founding, that our organization has become the most influential force in preservation in Pittsburgh and our nonprofit organization is recognized nationally and internationally for its innovative methods in revitalizing communities and generating economic development by putting historic preservation principles into practice. And that's kind of a mouthful, but that's a nutshell of really what we've been able to accomplish in 45 years of history now. So, who knew Jamie? Who, knew our, who knows Arthur, okay? Well, if we look to life and architecture, we have an introduction by Walter Kidney. And Walter Kidney describes a little bit about who Jamie Van Trump was. 
This book is now out of print, but it's one of my favorite. Walter has spoken to this group. Oh, good. Okay. And um, and so, you know, obviously Jamie grew up in this area and attended Carnegie Tech and University of Pittsburgh and spent years in the Carnegie, in the Pennsylvania room of the Carnegie Library. But just a couple sentences here that really talk about Jamie when he's going to become active in preservation from Walter. The Jamie who has become familiar to thousands of Pittsburghers emerged suddenly in 1956 when the Charette Journal of the Pittsburgh Architectural Club published Pittsburgh's Church of the Ascension. From then on, Jamie's pent-up knowledge flowed massively and inexhaustibly. The sheer quantity of his writing in the Charette, Carnegie Magazine, Western Pennsylvania Historical Magazine, the Pittsburgher, less frequently in other publications and in script form for WQED FM, is obvious from a mere glance at the bibliography of this book. In 1957, Jamie met a young student of English literature, Arthur Ziegler, who became an increasingly close associate in the next few years. First, Arthur, who was teaching at Carnegie Tech, joined the staff of the Charette, and then in 1964 the two broke away from the current management of the magazine to form their own publishing company, and the new firm offered advertising and public relations services, historic preservation consultation, and became itself the publisher of the Charette. Meanwhile in 1964, something else happened. Who knows the famous story of walking on Liverpool Street? It's a great story. Okay, so here's the paragraph describing it in Walter's words, and then we'll turn to Arthur's description of it. Meanwhile, in 1964, another organization was formed. Jamie and Arthur recount that one winter afternoon in the late 1950s, they were in Liverpool Street in Pittsburgh's Manchester district, looking at a handsome but decayed row of Victorian houses. This was still the time when conventional urban renewal was triumphant. The city went into a neighborhood, destroyed almost everything, and rebuilt. The new neighborhood had no past, and therefore very little character. And much that was beautiful or still useful was gone. Manchester itself was populated in part by refugees from the near total destruction of the Lower Hill in the 1950s, in preparation for a showy cultural acropolis that materialized only in fragments. Jamie and Arthur determined then and there on that sad street that something effective should be done about saving historic architecture. They organized the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation, found sponsors, and set to work. Jamie was the scholar, Arthur the businessman. Both were important to an organization with the authoritative character needed to succeed in saving buildings and indeed whole neighborhoods. <coughs> We are not the Historical Society. We are not the History Center. Obviously, the Western Pennsylvania Historical Society is in control of the History Center. We are not the History Center because Arthur and Jamie initially went to Stan Balfour, who was then head of the Pittsburgh Foundation and also head of the Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania, and said, Liverpool Street is now going to be demolished. Enough has been demolished already. We've got to do something to stop this. We have to form a, we have to do something to celebrate our architectural heritage. Will you work with us? And the Historical Society said, no, we're a quieter organization than located in Oakland on Bigelow. We like our archives and library, and we do some events, but we don't want to get in front of the bulldozer and be involved in all this urban renewal controversy. And so, Stan Balfour gave his blessing on having a new organization formed, and so it was up to Arthur and Jamie then to figure out who in Pittsburgh valued preservation. So they went to the National Trust in Washington, D.C., and said, may we see your membership list? Who here in Pittsburgh is a member of the National Trust? And Barbara Hofstadt, living on Fifth Avenue in a wonderful big home, was one of the members, and so they made a connection with Barbara Hofstadt and with Charlie Arnsberg, and Arthur and Jamie started to make connections with Helen Clay Frick and with people who cared about historic preservation. They needed advice. They didn't know what to do. And two young men without any resources, without any grand connections in Pittsburgh, 
And they were told to go see this man, Adolf Schmidt. And we published this book just about two years ago because Clark Thomas wrote this book about his, uh, at the request of Tom Schmidt, who is the son of Adolf Schmidt, okay? And A.W. Schmidt was head of the um, A.W. Mellon Educational and Charitable Trust. And so he was, he married a Mellon, and he was very influential in charitable giving in Pittsburgh. And Jane and Arthur went to him and this fellow, Mr. Schmidt, said, you can't save anything or advocate for preservation until you know what there is in the county. And so he said, you have to make a survey of the county. And Arthur and Jamie said, good idea. We do need a survey. You can't save what you don't know about. And you can't argue on behalf of what you don't know and love. And Jamie had been doing lots of research, but still, what was really out there? That was to be determined. So this book is the result of the first survey that Jamie and Arthur did. And they conducted it in 1966 with funding and finished it about a year later. And I want to share with you just a few passages, and then really that will be the end of my story reading. But, um, but it, they are, these books are wonderful. So we learn. And this is now Arthur writing an introduction, both personal and pragmatic, uh, uh, programmatic, both personal and programmatic. Since 1936, the city had experienced massive redevelopment. The countryside suffered suburban sprawl. The highway departments had been permitted to demolish buildings for new roads and road relocations at will. And a good many early houses had simply collapsed with age. <coughs> We therefore faced the necessity of completing anew a countywide survey of existing buildings before we could proceed with the act of planning wisely for preservation. And for this purpose, we made application to the A.W. Mellon Educational and Charitable Trust for a grant of $30,000. The money was given to us in July 1965, and we predicted that the work would be completed in the fall of 1966. So they do some research in the libraries, and they actually poll their members. A membership is beginning to um, attach itself to the History of Landmarks Foundation, and members gave them ideas about what was significant. But looking at all the papers still wasn't doing the job. The work was incomplete, Arthur writes. What nuggets might be hidden in the gridiron of North Side or the green valleys of O'Hara Township? What rich vein might be mined in Glenshaw or lodestones found on the streets of Duquesne. The demand was obvious. We had to sally forth, not without dust and heat and search. From late September to early January, we made our way through the county almost every day, seven days a week. We walked the densely built areas of the city like the hill, north side, south side, downtown, and Lawrenceville. And we drove through the rest of the county. A Corvair, already at the ancient age of four years and 55,000 miles, bumped over the Belden bricks, the concrete, the gravel, the encrusted mud, and ultimately the caked snow throughout this period of intensive work. Our only misadventures were three flat tires, but as the hours of driving slackened in the late winter and spring, the car itself lost momentum and put it to its own, putted to its own final stop in March. But as I say, I was naive. I expected more. All of the new experiences that quicken the senses and fire the mind were reduced, overshadowed, vitiated by the sight of this desecration that man had wrought. While it was no secret that much of the architecture of the county is unfortunate, it is demoralizing to be exposed to it so intensively. All too often, buildings are cheap, unimaginative, poorly designed, and ugly. And it does not matter whether they are old or new. They stand as ironic monuments to our willingness to abide the expedient, the kind of housing that we endure, the wretched shopping districts or shopping centers we permit, the bad taste we flaunt should appall us. But this book is not meant to be a tombstone or an elegy to some of the wonderful buildings we did find. We hope it will in some small way help them achieve salvation. For this architecture of value must be saved, 
In the midst of so much bad site planning, a Chatham village becomes even more important. With so little left of the 18th century, the Neolog House in Shenley Park deserves the more distinction. With almost no rural, rural communities of architectural character, the town called Boston is paramount. The crash of the headache ball, the falling stones, the crumbling brick and rotting wood discourage everyone sensitive to our architectural heritage. Worse often than rampart demolition or collapse are the structures erected on the old sites. But the ravaging of the emblems of our past can spur us on. Across this country, an awareness of beauty, an interest in history, a commitment to preservation is developing. We present to the public this book as evidence that here in Allegheny County, we can be dedicated to this cause and to know the cause to which we should be dedicated. Yes? Is that Ziegler or Ben from? That's but, Ziegler writing. Thank you. Yeah. And so, you know, when you read some of that, it's still very fresh and true today. But there then was the first book that documented things that should be saved. And so that set the stage for what could be done. So then a bit of money was needed, and the, Scaife, the Sarah Scaife Foundation came forward in 1966, just about time this survey was under, being undertaken, and a concept, new concept, was launched for a revolving loan fund. And this was, in the end, a book that Arthur published on the revolving loan fund, and it became a whole instrument of how to uh, revitalize inner city neighborhoods throughout the country. The idea was is that with a bit of money, you could take a key property on a corner in the Mexican War Streets or in Manchester, and you could restore that building and then rent the apartment and get the income and have it revolve back. And then you could use some of those funds to do another project. And as you move from house to house, a ripple effect would be created in the neighborhood and others would start to invest in the neighborhood. So as you know, that work started in Manchester, Mexican War Streets, and continued then to Main Street. So from residential, we moved to Main Streets, East Ohio Street, East Carson Street. 1968, we began the public plaque program. And the plaque program was probably the first in the nation, we think, where really a nonprofit organization is trying to put a plaque on a building and say this matters. The plaque has no legal significance. It's public recognition only, but that was enough. Our first newsletter was published in 1966, and this newsletter was two-sided, but it's very interesting. Survey and registry was a category of work. History for children was a category of work. Demolition with tears, they're talking about the loss of the Northside Market House. 50 new members and six months of intensive study of a row of houses, 1300, 1335 Liverpool Street preparing a preservation code to go to city council. And Anne's going to speak a bit about, in, in the end, some of our efforts with the city right now. Just to give you a feel, when I came to History and Landmarks, this was our newsletter that we did in 1992, 1982, sorry, 1982. And I had to typeset all of this on my computer. And if I wanted to make it italics, I took another silver thing and stuck it on the computer on the typewriter. <laughs> and that made it go italics. And then we cut everything out and we pasted it down. Uh -huh. And this is how we did a newsletter. Yeah. But still, this is 20 years later. And we're still doing things with our members. We're still doing education programs. Allegheny County Survey. By now, we actually are updating the survey that Arthur and Jamie did. We updated it through a comprehensive effort. Um, and so this little is, article is focusing on small town stations. If you look at our newsletter today, this is a digression to newsletters, you have something that says this particular issue, a 16-page newsletter, graphically much more attractive, okay? And so there's progress there. Still a lot of events for members. And bringing you right up to the present, this is going to be the cover of our April issue when we're announcing Market and Fifth set to open in May. And so we still have to plop in photographs, but the process of making newsletters continues. So by the time we moved into the 70s, 
we had moved into the old post office museum. That was a building we saved. It's now the Children's Museum. It was originally the post office for the separate city of Allegheny, a building from 1897. In just a few highlights in the 70s, in 1974, we collaborated to form the Rachel Carson Homestead Association. So all over the county, we were beginning to help rescue the Neil Log House that had collapsed in Shenley Park, or work with the Burtner House by North 28, or work with the Rachel Carson people to um, save that farmhouse in Springdale. In 1975, we had an auxiliary volunteer committee begin a drive to raise $250,000 to re restore Phipps Conservatory, mm -hmm. in terrible shape then. The city alone couldn't do it. A public-private partnership here was the answer. In 1976, many important events. We acquired Woodville Plantation, that's in Collier Township, off of I-79. Um, it's the Kerwin Heights exit. And um, we saved that house. And then just this past year, we transferred ownership of that to the volunteer group that had operated it on a daily basis. So that Woodville Plantation now from the house itself was begun about 1785, is now in the control of the Neville House Associates. Also in 1976, we collaborated with the commissioners uh, to convert the courtyard of the Allegheny County Courthouse, long a parking lot, into that beautiful park that you have today, with the fountain, with the benches. So that was in 1976. So that design by Richardson was always a parking lot for horses and wagons to begin with, and then all the cars came in. And then we said, this is too, too beautiful a space to have as a parking lot. In 1976, we also announced the Station Square project. Thanks to a $5 million grant from the Allegheny Foundation, and that made all the difference in the world to convincing the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad that we were serious about helping them wrestle with the problem of what to do with underutilized buildings. And as you know, by the time we sold Station Square in 1994, and I'll get to that, we had eventually acquired 52 acres of land. We began by leasing land. If we look at the decade of the 1980s, Still in Manchester, we rescued the Langenheim House from demolition. We completed a preservation restoration study for Allegheny Cemetery. There was the Jenkins Arcade loss. There was the Moose Building loss. The Syria Mosque, I think, was also lost in the 1980s. With the Moose Building loss, though, in downtown Pittsburgh, because of the construction of what we now call Dominion Towers, it was originally called CNG Towers, and it's also now called 625 Liberty Avenue, but Heinz interests were behind that. We did, though, secure in 1983 the designation of the Penn Liberty Natural, National Register District. And by doing that, the following year, the Cultural Trust was created. And the Cultural Trust then had to have the mission of preserving and renovating the Stanley Theater and creating cultural venues in existing buildings, because with the National Register Protection, there were tax incentives now available to actually rehabbing some of those buildings. So the loss of the Moose Building was the trade-off for the preservation of the Penn Liberty District and all of the efforts of the cultural trusts that are really based in historic preservation um, efforts. Also in the 80s, our preservation loan fund became very active. We moved from the revolving fund of actually acquiring properties and renting to actually lending money to neighborhood groups that were now developing and forming in the grassroots um, kind of communities. And they knew what they wanted to do with the building. They didn't need <coughs> us to be telling them anymore what to do. So we would lend them money instead. Anybody been to East Allegheny where you have the Grand Hall? It's an old church called St. Mary's. Well, we gave a loan to help make that project possible. Anybody had a, had a glass of Penn Pilsner in that Everhart and Over Brewery? We gave a loan to make that project possible on the north side. We did more surveys, about, as I mentioned, this uh, countywide survey that has 6,000 survey forms completed. And we also then started some thematic surveys, like on Frederick Scheibler buildings or iron and steel historic research resources, and we were able to have 
48 Pittsburgh public schools listed on the National Register. We, we helped save um, in terms of reuse and light, we helped save and light the Smithfield Street Bridge in 1984. And in 1989, St. Peter's Episcopal Church, some of you might remember that, it had been moved stone by stone from Grant Street up to Fifth and Craft Avenues right at the um, entrance to Oakland. And we had lobbied very hard for the preservation of that famous building designed by, in 1852, by John Notman, a Philadelphia architect. And unfortunately, the Pittsburgh City Council voted against marking that building as a city historic structure, which, it, which would have given it some uh, preservation clout. And so in 1989, one of our major efforts was defeated on November 28th, thanks to City Council. But <laughs> A day or two later, in 1989 also, the Pittsburgh City Council happened to extend this award to us, quote, thanks, the Pittsburgh City Council thanks, congratulates, and commends landmarks, and implores landmarks to keep alive for future generations the cherished memories of the region's unique and bountiful past. Oh. So I love that conflict. Unbelievable. 1990s, just quickly. African American Historic Site Survey. We all we undertook that and ended up publishing a book. Al Tandler, who's with us now as our historical collections director and author of books, uh, joined our staff in 1991. We began our historic religious properties program through a grant, a study in 1992, and then began in 1997 to offer an annual program of financial and technical assistance. In 1993, Arthur received the National Trust for Historic Preservation's highest award, the Louise DuPont Crown and Shield Award. In 1994, Charlie Arnsberg, who had served as our chairman for 30 years, resigned. Basically, he was elderly and he had done as much as he could. So for 30 years, we had the same chairman of the board. Charlie was incredible. Did any of you know Charlie Arnsberg? Wonderful man, bright blue eyes, just fantastic leader. And on August 31st in 1994, Landmark sold Station Square for about $25 million. We had invested and served as the prime real estate developer in a project that in the end kind of totaled about $100 million. But we realized about $25 million for that, and we sold it to a joint venture comprised of subsidiaries of the Promise Companies and Forest City Enterprises. All revenue coming to Landmarks was to be used to benefit the Pittsburgh region through preservation and education programs with particular emphasis on historic neighborhoods, and that has happened. And so we are one of the few nonprofit organizations ever that has been able to do its work, and by doing its work, generate income to support more of that work. Now, a slight aside. About two months, three months ago, I got a call from some fellow from Cornell University who was pursuing his graduate degree in historic preservation. His name is Nathaniel Guest. And Nathaniel said that their assignment was to choose any city in America that they were not familiar with. Every student in the graduate <coughs> class had to do this. And he had never been to Pittsburgh, and he wanted to come to Pittsburgh, and he decided he would come to Pittsburgh and answer the question he had to and write a big paper about this question. And his teacher had assigned him the question of, find in one city a publicly funded preservation project and a preservation funded preservation project and compare them. Well, I said, you can come to Pittsburgh and I can tell you about lots of privately funded projects, but I can't tell you about many publicly funded projects. I, can't, I can tell you where a few public funds have helped a project, the Union Project, for example, the Church Project, which is on, what's the cross street there? Stan, Stan, okay. Stan and Negley, that's right. Um, but basically, preservation in Pittsburgh is private, gen, private motivated. And he said, well, I'll see what my professor says, and I'll see if I can come anyway. He came anyway. The professor said, as long as the Union Project has a little bit of public money, you can do that. And so he then spent months talking to the Union Project and History and Landmarks and comparing the two and writing a wonderful paper. And so he got a quote during that process from Arthur about Station Square, and that's why I put this excerpt from his paper in here now, because we were talking in 1994 about the sale of Station Square. 
So from Nathaniel's paper, he's quoting Arthur, for, for all the value inherent to saving its beauty, preserving Station Square, as Arthur Ziegler sees it, has been about something principally more pragmatic. It was a demonstration of the economic value of historic preservation. Now this is the quote from Arthur. And I think that this is a real brilliant insight in the preservation in Pittsburgh. Ar <coughs> architecture is not, I'm sorry, I'll start again. Architecture is an art wholly based upon continuing utility. And utility is in turn grounded in the marketplace. When you accept the circumstance and apply the techniques of finance, real estate, and construction to the problems at hand, you compete on equal terms with the forces that destroy buildings. So there's that businessman that we identified in the very beginning <coughs> sketch of who's Jamie and who's Arthur. And it's a very important, I think, principle behind our organization which takes a practical, feasible approach to preservation. In 1994, interestingly enough, one month after we sold Station Square, Barbara Hofstadt died. And she died knowing that the sales agreement had been signed and knowing that we had really accomplished something with Station Square. She was a huge fan of Station Square. And knowing that we now had a way to have an operating base for an organization that could continue preservation principles in the city. One year later, Jamie died at the age of 86. The year two, decade 2000, since we're talking about deaths of major people, Walter Kidney died in 2005. And Walter, I haven't done justice to in this talk, but you knew him, he came to speak to you. And he was brilliant. And he would talk about history, he would talk about preservation as the glue that would hold a community together. And he would talk about the cord of history. And he could say that you can sever a few strands, but you still have the continuity of a place, the familiarity of a place, what makes that area home. David McCullough talks about without continuity, civilization falls apart. Walter would say when you sever that cord totally, then you totally have a disconnect in history. And that's what would happen in the urban renewal in East Liberty and in Lower Hill. When you totally sever that cord and wipe everything out in a massive way, then you um, sever um, the connection with the past. Walter also would talk about the sad fact of historic preservation. He loved new design. He loved beautiful design, as does Arthur. But the sad fact of historic <coughs> preservation is realizing that new design today is often not better than what was demolished. And so the sad fact is, is that what we have from the past is better than often what is built today and designed. Walter also had a way of using analogy to bring something, a building, an inanimate object to life. And I give an example, he would talk about PPG. And because of his words, I can explain things to kids now on tours. And he would say that the PPG place, which he did, did like in many ways, but PPG place in Market Square, fronting on Market Square, looks like a Prussian regiment formed up to him the peasants. <laughs> and those kinds of words in books that he wrote give us the language to speak to people today. 2006, we had the National Preservation Conference. We began easements in a major way. We always had had an easement program, but Heinz Lofts, Cork Factory, Bedford Springs Hotel, we accepted easements. They were donated to our organization and it made the project work financially. So you could take the old Heinz factory buildings and turn them into apartments. The Cork factory, the Armstrong Cork factory in the Strip, turn it into apartments. Bedford Springs Hotel, our reach, we're starting to reach out. We used to always be Allegheny County, but now we have a 250 mile radius as we're into 2009 now. We are now doing through the Getty Foundation, we have done major surveys uh, of college campuses in the area, seven or eight college campuses over a two year period. We inventory the landscape and the buildings and we set priorities for preservation. And those documents become guides for the owners of the colleges so they know better how to maintain their landscape and buildings. The county has hired us to do a Main Street program so we're working in places like Swissvale and Terenum and um, Elizabeth. Gift planning, that's a big category of work at History and Landmarks now because Jack Miller, who does that, is such a creative 
person. If you share our values, then he can figure out how you and History and Landmarks can do something to save a house, or save a farm, or save something that, you're, that, you, that you have. Um, bridge lighting. Roberto Clemente Bridge, the Hot Metal Bridge, those are two bridges that slowly but surely we hope to have more bridges lit. Everything costs money though. New Granada Theater in the Hill. We're stabilizing that building right now as we speak. It's basically a $1.1 million project, but it was close to falling down. It was in very bad shape. And last year or so, I guess in the end of 2007, we created a new nonprofit subsidiary <coughs> called Landmarks Community Capital Corporation. And that allows us to take a more holistic approach to historic preservation because we can embrace through that nonprofit subsidiary new development opportunities as well as the restoration and, and um, reuse of existing historic structures. So, for example, on Penn Avenue, where you have new condos going up, we gave a loan to that development to make that work. In the past, we never would have given a loan to something that was totally new construction. But it's in a historic area, and so now we can do, uh, we can help fund new construction as long as it's going to help be part of a revitalization of a historic area. A big difference in the way we operate, in the old days we stood in front of the bulldozer, we made a lot of noise, and now behind the scenes. Our staff members and Arthur taking the lead are always working behind the scenes with people who are responsible for historic buildings and might not be moving in the right direction. <coughs> and Point Park University downtown, we continue to encourage them to save the old buildings and add new construction where there is a parking lot or something. But uh, the Pittsburgh Children's Museum was going to build new. We donated our building to them in the end, and they needed to expand, and so they were going to move into the parking lot and build new. And we said, there's a vacant Buell Planetarium right next to you. Why don't you let us do a feasibility study? We can show you that it will work to expand in that way convince Jane Werner to look that direction, and then you have a connecting structure, and what better example do you have of preservation than looking at that building that is the 19th, 20th, and 21st century, all for the price of one admission. In conclusion, I do have a final quote from Nat Nathaniel um, Guest, who, looking at Station Square and the Union Project as an outsider and a young person, not necessarily knowing a lot about Pittsburgh, but very observant, said this. He said in a summary of his paper that there was a sign in the Union Project that kind of summed up what he felt preservation meant in Pittsburgh. And the sign read, sometimes I really hate Pittsburgh because I love it so much. It would be an exercise in naivete to think one could fully understand the preservation universe of, of a city as large as Pittsburgh by looking at just two projects, Nathaniel writes, even groundbreaking ones such as the Union Project and Station Square. However, the Union Project sign belies a noble commonality driving preservation in Pittsburgh in all its hard scrabble against the odds, jagged brilliance. In the absence of public monies or sustained government support for preservation, Pittsburghers have rallied around and preserved those things sacred to the soul of their city. In the face of a history of urban renewal that destroyed and segregated much of the city, Station Square and the Union Project proposed restoration and community as better solutions. While both sought to be economically viable, neither contemplated get-rich-quick schemes. Preservation in Pittsburgh is, as the sign of the Union Project suggests, an effort born of love. The future of preservation. Well, today, a paragraph popped out of the newspaper in the Post-Gazette, and it had a tragic tone to it. And I thought, you know, what is the future of preservation, really? And this was a wonderful article announcing a new book in Pittsburgh with photographs. But the second paragraph of the article reads this. Pittsburgh is the sum of its parts, a stitched together terrible towel of shared loves and hates. Now that's great. A place where the best way to give directions often involves mentioning places 
that don't exist in any moment. Now that's sad. That's very sad. David Lewis. You can't have a talk without David Lewis. Pittsburgh is a city waiting to be discovered and explored, and he wrote this in the 70s. Is it a great city? No, not yet. I would say it has the makings of a great city. But whether it is a great city in the making depends not on the past, but on the future, on us, and on Pittsburgh's future citizens. So what we do, how we live, is going to show, if, you know, is going to uh, suggest if we have a preservation value as we move forward. In conclusion, basically, the story of preservation in Pittsburgh is the story of the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation. I do defend that. And our story is not a story of planning studies. It's not a story of committee meetings or task forces. It is a story that's very active and ongoing, creative. It's full of vision. I'm impressed always with the vision of our board and of Arthur, um, who continues to get younger, it seems. We are an, an organization of great ingenuity and persistence. We've got to be flexible, we have to have feasible plans, and we're very results oriented. We have fostered a preservation ethic in the city. There are two other preservation groups now, as well as ours, and there are dozens and dozens of grassroots community development groups working hard every day, fighting for their main streets and neighborhood. In our organization, we have more than 100 board members on various boards. We have a for-profit subsidiary because of Station Square called Landmarks Development Corporation, as well as Landmarks Community Capital Corporation. We have a staff of 25, we have 2,200 members, and we have more than 14,000 people of all ages involved in our educational programs each year. Thanks to Mary Cook, who's a docent, and Ann Robb, who's a docent, and Lori Cohen, who helps edit our publications and uh, gives people something good to read. But every day is a new challenge and a new battle, and with limited resources, we work with others to address major problems in communities, because in the end, as Arthur always says, through the place, you renew the spirit. I'd like to open up the conversation and have Anne, as a young staff member, who's our legal counsel, add um, any comments that she wishes, and I want to entertain some questions from all of you also. And I might end with some of our events. Uh, are there any efforts to save the Mama Novena? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a good question. <coughs> you know, we of course oppose the construction uh, of the Mama uh, Novena. But now, as Arthur says, the irony is, is that we're getting so old that now we have to change our position on something and perhaps advocate the preservation of it. Rob Fathman is an architect who has come up with an amazing scheme to save the Mellon Arena, but make it more of a center that doesn't cut off the hill so much from um, the city. We ourselves as an organization are not leading a discussion on that. We are waiting to see what consensus emerges from the community. Mm -hmm. And there are some people, Mindy Fullalov, who comes to Pittsburgh every so often to speak. Phil Howland brings her into town as an amazing sociologist. And she speaks about the Mellon Arena as basically the horrible drain plug. And you've got to pull it out to let the dirty water go away. So there are people who feel very strongly about absolutely getting rid of that. But when you look at the, the engineering and when you look at the amount of material, it would be absolutely horrible, I think, personally, I think, to get rid of that. I was thinking about that just recently myself, and I just talked about the fact that it was built for a movable circumstance, and because uh, I'm torn by it like everybody else is in this area, because my other part of the problem is to make it movable and to, with the purpose being as move, move, movable as an engineering feat, it's too <coughs> expensive to fix and make it movable. So, far well, between that problem. It's still movable. It's just that they it's have to take the stuff away that's in there. Yeah. There it is. We were in there with school kids about last week. We do a program right on um, Bedford Avenue, and we it's took the kids yeah. there into uh, Mellon Arena, and the 
they were so amazed about the ice and how does it turn into the monster truck arena, but also we were asking, <laughs> you know, we were asking how do you open up the roof and does it still open? And the fellow said, it opens without a problem. Mm -hmm. It simply is all the stuff that they've hung there, the scoreboard and all that, that it takes too much time to take that away to open up the roof. Uh -huh. and so it's only, it's only the internal things that they've hung there that have prevented them really from opening the roof. I have a memory of the Northern Arena when the Beatles were here. Oh, great. <laughs> they yes. opened up the roof. They yes. did. Oh, they, the roof was open. It was so beautiful. You could see the stars. You know? yeah. I've seen it. Westinghouse General Office building in Wilmer seems to be in limbo. They, they have a museum like the there. They took a lot of the stuff down to the history yeah. center. But it's a shame. It's a oh, fantastic building. It's a fantastic building, that Westinghouse air break, yes. And do you, well, did you all have a connection to it, or? Yeah, you know, a little. And I know we gave a loan, a short-term loan, and Anne, I don't know if you can speak any more about it, but it's a fantastic building, and I don't have an up-to-date report on it, but do you know We still have a, a loan out to that. Um, yeah, but that building inside and out, and I was, you know, when some of the Westinghouse collection went to the History Center, I thought, oh, because that prevented that organization exactly. from, having that archive there, which That's could draw. Right. draw people there, exactly. Yes? You mentioned the Union Project. Can you say something yeah. about that? that? Okay, the Union Project is interesting. There was a group, actually, a nonprofit group that is now called Pulse, P-U-L-S-E. But years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago by now, it was called, it was a Mennonite Urban Corps. That's what it was. And the Mennonite Urban Corps was like AmeriCorps. They would bring kids who had graduated from college to Pittsburgh, and then they would place them with nonprofit organizations. And we had one of those students working with us. And one of those students happened to live near Stanton and Negley, and they kept seeing this church that was basically a vacant, underutilized, an eyesore in the neighborhood. And these young kids started to think, who weren't even from Pittsburgh, but they started to think, why don't we get some people together and start to work on this church? And they finally did get, History and Landmarks gave them some money, Arthur gave them some advice, but it was purely a group of young people who had a desire to make this church a community center. And they, one inventive idea they had, they had beautiful stained glass windows, and they couldn't pay for John Kelly or somebody to come in and restore all the stained glass windows. So they started to have workshops at the, the church, and you could sign up and pay $75 to come and learn how to restore a stained glass window. And people signed up, and they came, and they learned, and they had one hired professional who then taught everyone how to restore the windows, and they were restoring the very own windows in the church. Oh. And so they did all of those sorts of innovative approaches. And now, if you go to that church, I think that they have a coffee shop in there. They have a space, meeting space for um, artists, and the, the artists pay rent to the organization, and so they certainly have gotten some public money, they've gotten private foundation money, um, and at one point in their history, just maybe four years ago, people from the neighborhood came and vandalized the church, and yet they did not give up, and they you know, have maintained their presence there, and the neighbors, most of the neighbors, were so upset that the vandalizing had occurred that they actually rallied and even gave more support to the project. So it's an amazing success story of simply a group of committed people who didn't know what they were getting into and following through. Can anybody else add to that firsthand? <laughs> Union Project, it really is. It's right on Negley Avenue and Stanton. And it's a church that has always been kind of soot-soaked in terms of the story. It has a single tower, and um, I can't what's, describe it any more than that. What's the name of the church? So, I mean, what was the original? No, what was the original name of the church? I've been in there. They have, uh, they have ceramic, they have display of the artists yeah. in there. It's very nice. I can't remember the original name. Yes. It's a bit of a dull rooms, too, actually, right now. Um, well, all these projects are going to be in the doldrums right now because with the down, major downturn in the economy. With a depressed economy, you have foundations who have lost money in their endowments, and they don't have as much money to give in grants to these organizations. And these are, you know, this union project does have ways of getting some revenue, but you are trying to take care of 
a building that has to be heated and lit and you have people on staff and so it's a very tough tightening, belt tightening situation now for every organization that is a nonprofit. And you know, for profit making businesses, you're going out of business. Michael. Could you talk a little about Fifth and Forbes and your most oh, recent great. Okay. Your most recent development okay. activity? Well, Fifth and Forbes, you know, Arthur always likes to put and the Murphy administration. So the Murphy administration came out with a plan that was calling for the demolition of perhaps sixty buildings right along Forbes Avenue and in the area to Fifth and including downtown. they want downtown, right, downtown, right by Market Square. And of course the terrible thing about this was that it was in an area that the city had designated as a city historic district. Market Square was the first city historic district designated, I think in 1972. And so here the mayor wants to come along and do something in, in this area that would include demolishing some buildings in the periphery of Market Square. And the city reversed its decision. And so when you think about what you know, what, if you have something designated as a city historic structure, it's supposed to have some clout, but right away then the politicians reverse that decision, so it has no clout whatsoever. So we were formed, and we formed with a lot of people, especially the business owners down there, to oppose the city's plan that was to take over through eminent domain some of these properties and bring in a Nordstrom's and bring in a big cinema <coughs> and demolish the buildings. The National Trust listed Fifth and Forbes on its most endangered list, and we had a press conference with Dick Moe. Well, in the end, the Mer Nordstrom's uh, pulled out. Now, who knows if Nordstrom's pulled out because of the preservation opposition, or if Nordstrom's pulled out just because they were sick of dealing with the city or whatever. But when Nordstrom's pulled out, Murphy then came to the table and started talking with preservation groups and started to reshift his plan. But still, he was always thinking about one big developer coming in and taking the whole project. And Arthur kept saying always, this project is too big for one big developer, and why not let it occur more naturally, piecemeal by piecemeal. And so what happened was, at one point, the URA acquired, they started to acquire a lot of buildings, and Fifth Forbes got a lot worse. Um, and the merchants knew that they could sell for a pretty high price, inflated high prices, because they knew the city wanted to get control of a lot of these properties for their development. And so at one point the URA, right along Fifth Avenue and Market Street, owned three buildings, two from 1875 maybe, Italian 8, and one from 1908 designed by Alden and Harlow who designed the Duquesne Club and the Carnegie Library. And that was the old Regal Shoe and it was kind of an arts and crafts building that faces Fifth Avenue. And those three buildings share walls, and the roof on one of the 1870 buildings had fallen through to the basement mm -hmm. and had taken the third and second floors with it. And those buildings were probably going to be lost and, and if somebody didn't buy them. Well, who was going to buy them? Nobody in their right mind, because it was a sinkhole. You, they make movies about projects like that. And so History Landmarks ended up acquiring, in 2007, those three buildings. And we began a project called Market at Fifth. So we thought, as long as we were opposing the big plan, we should put our money where our mouth is and start to try to renovate some of these buildings. And then in 2008, we acquired the fourth building right next to the three, so we now own, right on Market Street, the old Thompson's building that had the Chow Baby restaurant. And we own the two Italianate buildings and we own the Regal Shoe Company building. And in May, you will have three of the buildings opening up. And it's called Market and Fifth. And there, on the second floor, we're going to have four apartments. And on the third floor, we're going to have three apartments. And the um, they will look out onto a roof garden that's a green garden. It's a LEED certified project, meaning it, it's a healthy building. And um, they will have a new retail space on the main floor. And then we're not doing anything yet with the Thompson's building. It's not in bad shape, the Chow Baby building. We're going to get through this year and pay the bills that we have to pay. Wasn't, and, uh, excuse me, wasn't one of them fire damage? Um, I don't know if, I know that the roof had collapsed and I don't think that there was a fire in any of those buildings, okay. no. 
And I then, interesting. In another building at Market Square. But okay. Yeah, and then across the street, we acquired the Thompson's Chow Baby building, and that's a 1927 building, because the people who owned it also owned the Buell building across the street, the beautiful blue and white building. And we somehow, you know, said, okay, we're going to buy this building, and the money you get from us, you can use then to redo your Buell building and give us a facade easement on the building. So that facade is always taken care of in the future. And Anne might speak a little bit about, and even Michael, you guys are the authorities, but you might speak a bit about the easements and how they work. If uh, Just do you want to add a little bit about that? Uh, preservation easements are just legal agreements where they basically give us the right to control the exterior of a property or, or the development rights on top of it. And as Louise was saying about the local historic preservation ordinance being turned around and reversed, preservation easements are there in perpetuity. We will always own the exterior of these properties and we will always control what can happen to those. To maintain them, like you put We don't maintain them, them, but the property owner is required to maintain them. So, where do they get on it? Um, if it's in a national register, certified historic district, or individually listed, the property owner gets a tax deduction. Which is my field, <laughs> and, which is why I'm not here all the time. Um, the, uh, the Heinz Laws and Armstrong Court could not have been done as apartments if the property owner did not get the they got two tax breaks. One's called the uh, tax credit, which is used more often. But if they hadn't done easements and gotten investment money, there were gaps in the financing, and they couldn't have done the project. So they, and, and with big buildings like that, we're not talking about small benefits. Yeah, Roger. Two things. Yeah. I remember Jimmy Van Trump being a CV back on Facebook. Yeah, Al Julius. Yeah, Al Julius, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. oh, he was quite a, quite a personality. And that's, you know, he was a very quiet retiring figure to begin with. But when he really started to, you know, from 1956 on, when he started, and when History Landmarks was formed in 1964, Walter and Arthur both talk about how he just burst into a personality. And he is... People still remember his radio broadcasts, his TV shows with Al Julius, and the tours he led. And he always had a long beard, and always looked like he was a hundred, hair all over. But he was just so, so poetic. And um, there's one little paragraph. Let me read it since we're talking about Jamie and nostalgia. And then we can end on that. And, oh, you have another thing? Okay. This is Arthur writing about Jamie, and I think it's the best paragraph Arthur's ever written. Many cities have their historians. I know of none which has an interpreter of the experiences of the past that have affected people, accretion by accretion, who offers them up in such a sumptuous style, beautiful as an art in itself. Jamie reminds us that our buildings reflect lives. They express and symbolize those people who were involved in creating and in using them. And he renders for us with endearment the things that we may have put away or not even noticed, like those yellow daisies on the golden afternoon at the forgotten train station. Yeah. I mean, that's good. Yeah. And I mean, Jamie and Walter were good, and Al. And we, as a preservation group, unlike most other groups in America, have always had brilliant writers. And if you have brilliant writers and researchers who know what they're talking about, then the rest of you can have something to say. Last question. Yeah. Uh, the Home and Amigo Opera Company. Oh, right, up in Homewood. Yeah. Uh, Dan Holland and the Young Preservation Group are working with the local community there. And, you know, every, every project is a huge effort. There is no magic answer saying that somebody's giving $5 million to save that building. So if a building isn't lived in and if it isn't cared for by the owner, it's a problem. So I don't, do you have any more news on the Negro, it's National Negro? It's been nominated as a city historic structure and it was condemned and I believe the um, Young Preservation has held a clean up, a clean up and, and they, they're working with the city and, and it's, they're working to raise funds to re restore the property. But it's held in, it's held privately. So it's not publicly owned, so there are issues with getting grant monies to help it. So, but it, it's, it's safe right now. 
The last question. The last question. Um, you know what's happening with Shelley High School? Because it does oh, have no. a... Uh, uh, I just thought such a such a sad situation. Um, I, you know, I expect somebody will buy it at some point. You know, I would think they, they would, but I don't know. Will no, they be able to tear it down, or can they, they have to preserve no, it? No, it, it's in a National Register of Historic right. District, yeah. but that doesn't protect it from a private owner demolishing the building. That's terrible. Because if federal funds are involved, then the National Register designation does prohibit um, demolition, probably. But if it's on the National Register, a private property owner can still do what it wants with the building. Now, I'm not sure about the city. It might be in a city historic district, too. And so if it's in a city historic district, then as long as the city doesn't change its mind, then that does offer exterior protection to the building. And I do believe it's in a city historic district. I don't think so it is. So that happens. plaque doesn't protect the building at all, does it? Oh, no. our plaque gives no protection whatsoever yeah. to the building. It's and a terrible. city historic, if something has a local protection, yes, in the ordinance of the city of Pittsburgh, you cannot make any change to the exterior of your building without first having the HRC, the historic Review Commission, approve that change. So people in the Mexican War Streets or Allegheny West, or um, in Oakland, there's a, you know, there are 14 or so historic districts in the in the city. They have to get approval first for exterior changes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. I'm going to ask you to indulge me for a few minutes because I can add a, a bit to, to what Louise is talking about. She just talked about the fact that the local the National Register does not protect the building. It's more of a prestige item and, and a way to get special tax benefits because most of the federal tax benefits are only available for uh, buildings that are National Register. The, the rehab tax credit is uh, given $8 billion of money since the late 70s in terms of historic preservation. Historic land, uh, Pittsburgh Landmark did not have an easement program till about four or five years ago. And then what happened, as Arthur's told me the story, was that uh, they could, when Lord and Taylor took over the building, which uh, later gave up very quickly, you may remember, I wouldn't hear, but they destroyed the uh, very nice interior. Yeah. And there were no protections. And Arthur then told me he realized that none of the laws in themselves were strong enough to do that, whether it's because the law wasn't strong enough to begin with or because the law could be always changed, as in Fifth and Fourth. The easement program that Louise mentioned, and, and we spend 95% of our time doing appraisals on historic buildings to measure what, what the loss is for tax benefits. But the, Pittsburgh History Landmarks, in recognizing that it was missing a tool, began an easement program. And there have been easements mainly on houses around the country for a long time, but more and more large commercial buildings are using it. And uh, it, a deed is given on the facade, sometimes rarely in the interior of a building. A group like History and Landmarks has to forever monitor it, and they have the legal rights to force improvements if, if a building is not being taken care of, and implicitly they can keep it from being demolished, which is the, the really important thing. And uh, I, I want to finish with a story that's not Pittsburgh. How many of you know the Bedford uh, Springs Resort? You may remember that it has gone through checkered history for many years, including at one point the PSO wanting to have a summer festival there. And it has a, a Ross golf course uh, next to it. With the golf course is a National Historic Landmark because Ross is such a well-known <coughs> golf designer. But for years, the hotel was shut down. And a, Cal a Texas developer spent five years trying to redo it. But he didn't have enough money. And then a Cleveland developer who did Heinz and who had worked with these historic easements a lot with us in Cleveland and on Heinz made a marriage with this Texas developer and suggested that here was the missing piece, that if he put an easement on the golf course, 
and the property, which also prohibited extra buildings from being built on the property as well as messing with the building, that enough extra money would be generated through a syndication so that Bedford could finally be finished. And I, anyone who wants to see historic preservation in action, go and see that resort now, which was reopened a year and a half ago. It's just stunning. And, uh, and I don't know if it's going to, it, it's probably going to have some troubles now as all hotels because of the economy. But it, it's just beautiful. And the easement was the last piece. A group, a historic group, has to take the easement to make it work. They're the enabler. The Bedford Historical Society had never done anything like this, and they weren't very interested. The Cleveland developer, John Virchow, came to History of Landmarks and said, how would you like to take an easement on a property, there's a fee for managing the easement, on a property in central Pennsylvania? And that's what Louise is talking about in terms of subtly expanding the uh, the area in which history and landmarks are doing things. But but go and see that building if you're ever in Bedford. It's just three miles south of the turnpike. It is just wonderful. As are Hines and as are uh, by another developer, the Cork Project. And uh, by the way, Armstrong Cork hung around for a number of years without enough money to, to do that project till these tax credits and easements became available for to finish it up. I want to make one announcement that I've forgotten before. The East Liberty and East End Historical Society, which gave a very nice program to us three months ago, they're having a wine and cheese open house from 5.30 to 7.30 to 200 Highland Avenue tomorrow night. And it seems to be open to the public, so I just mentioned that. It's probably too it's short notice. I think it is. Or me. A week from today, uh, from tomorrow. I'm glad you said that because I was about ready to go tomorrow. <laughs> um, thanks again. Any questions before we break? Thank you for your continued support. I won't, but we'll see you next month. <laughs> Oh, I can take you